if you can show someone that the people that they respect and the people that they just trust and are around are using your product, are going along with whatever it is that you want or support your decision, that person is so much more likely to go along with it. Like that's, it's really obvious and we forget that sometimes, but sometimes the clearest path to someone we need to get to is not directly to them, but through the other people who they interact with. Um, and then there's scarcity is the last one on his list, uh, which is obviously when something is more scarce, you're more likely to want it because it could disappear and your chance to have it could vanish forever. Uh, and of those, we're gonna concentrate mainly on the first two, on reciprocity and consistency. Uh, there's also a lot of different types of buyers uh, or types of um, people who you want things from or just like types of people you interact with and motivations differ a lot and we're not going to talk too much about those either. This is sort of a one solution fits all kind of uh, proposal. Um, so the uh, different types of buyers, I mean just like a little sampling of some. There's people who are buying because of scarcity. There's people get buying because they think they need it to survive, like the high executive who's just buying a new iPhone, like the latest thing because he always needs the latest piece of technology. Um, there's people who buy for convenience, for prestige, um, to better their community, for value because they want the best deal out of fear. Um, there's a lot of reasons that people buy and there's probably a book, there's probably 10 books written on every single one of those for just how to address that one person's concerns. Uh, so definitely you can go up, uh, out and look up that stuff. And that's once again tied a lot more into sales as well. Like anything that's actually related to getting your product in someone's hands, there's so much written about out there. Definitely go and delve more into it if you're curious. Um, and that said, once again, from here we're going to delve into some specific, uh, blah, blah, specific topics. Uh, just about how to actually uh, get in there and get something that you want from someone. Um, and the biggest thing to me is, once again, tied into that dopamine release too, which is just like, you actually have to want to work with them instead of like trying to get something out of them or thinking that you're working at odds or even that this is like uh, a negotiation rather than a discussion, I guess is a good way to think about it. Um, like the goal, the goal is for both of you to be happy, um, not for you to just like go away being the winner. Um, and that's like, for some reason, I don't know, maybe it's like all of the crazy movies that I watched about like big business before I got into actually owning my own business or something. But like, it's actually a really hard mindset sometimes for me to like slip into or like the bigger the discussion is, like the more higher level and the more money is involved, the more I like want to slip into this kind of like business mindset. Um, and it's really silly, like the more casual and just the more approachable and the more you're a human being, I find even is a good way to put it. Uh, the easier it is to get people to go along with you. And it's like, the truth is just everyone is human beings like all the way up the chain. And uh, that was, yeah, it took me quite a while to learn, actually. Um, yeah, be a good human being, right? I'm still learning that one. Um, yeah, going in with their interests in mind, too. Um, like, even knowing that, it's still... <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's, still, it's still sometimes hard, even, like, even knowing that, to go in uh, with their interests in mind. Like, it's really easy to go in and start pitching um, what you want and even, like, your end goal of what can happen without thinking about what immediately they can get out of it, or how they can see some benefit, or how it's going to help them. Uh, which seems really simple, but it's, like I said, really easy to m mess up, especially when it's for some kind of greater good or community good. I feel like we get tied up in the message of, here's what is for the community, and let's like, hey, if you do this, like, it'll actually really help you in this way. We're gonna release these press releases, and your name will be on every single one. We're going to, like coming out with, this is a list of the things that you will be getting personally or for your business is crucial. Um, asking a lot of questions when you initially go in to talk to people is a good way to figure this out too. Um, and I, I found this out too, even just giving advice to my friends on like something really simple. Uh, you know, like what kind of like, gosh, I don't know, what kind of ice cream they should get for like the root beer float Sunday party. Um, and it's like, you have to ask some questions if you're just like, oh yeah, you need to get like the dryers. You come in a big tub and it's like, well, you know, and then you ask questions. You're like, well, what are you worried about with your ice cream party? And they're like, well, I just really want to have like this small gourmet party, like five people, you know, like the best local fresh ingredients that I can get. And it's like, oh, like you would have just given them an answer that doesn't make any sense for what they were actually looking for. Um, and even when based on limited experience, you know exactly what the right answer is, still ask questions. Like, because questions show that you're getting a better sense even if you know, like they've said one thing and you're able to fill in the blanks just because you have that much experience. Um, asking those questions shows engagement and to make sure that they know that you're paying attention to what they need. Like you're getting a full picture right there in front of them, like in their eyes for what they need done. Um, asking questions is super important. Yeah, like I've just in my head been like, I know what I'm gonna tell them after this and been gone on like a half an hour's worth of questions and then said the exact same thing I was gonna say at the beginning. 
And like ever since I started doing that, it's like your advice actually starts getting taken because you're treating the problems more seriously too. And lots of times you find when you start doing that that your, their, your questions lead you in a totally different direction than the answer you were going to give is actually completely different from what they wanted to hear. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, understand um, and understanding why people don't say yes. Like, there's a lot of reasons to not say yes. Um, the reasons to say no are it doesn't take you anything to like it doesn't change anything in your life. To say no, you're like no, and then you just go about doing exactly what you're doing anyway. Um, if you say yes, suddenly like you have to spend more time on something. Maybe you have more responsibility that comes along with something. Maybe there's risk. Maybe there's some kind of like financial or physical involvement that's going to happen. You actually have to give something to someone. There's a lot of reasons. <laughs> like, mainly it's just a hassle to start agreeing to things. Um, <laughs> so you have to come up with like a good reason why you're worth that time or involvement or investment. Um, and just knowing what that is, whether it's money or whether it's time or whether it's risk or whether it's like they have a pre-existing relationship with someone else who's trying to get them to do the exact same thing and why would they go with you and their best friend of 30 years is trying to get them to do it. Like understanding whatever that main objection is, the main thing that's like making their life more complicated to say yes is a really good thing to delve into as well. Um, and don't end up haggling. It's kind of the last one along with working with someone and not against them. Um, haggling is just the end result of like, I don't know, a bad approach, I guess. Like if you're getting down to just going back and forth between numbers, then to me that says you're not understanding a lot of the other auxiliary benefits that you can get. A lot of times negotiation will end up much more like you're providing some kind of service and reference and something else and they're getting this out of it and maybe there's money switching hands as well but there's also some product involved as soon as it becomes this linear uh you know you're somewhere along the spectrum and you're going to end up here and one of you has one side and the other has the other side that like spells failure and just to me says like you're not working together so just a little warning side that can pop sign that can pop up there is like if you ever find yourself in a haggling situation something probably went wrong and you might want to try and free yourself from that pretty soon um <coughs> Setting the stage right is the next thing. Uh, before we even get into like the discussion and the negotiating tactics, uh, doing research on who you're talking to, same thing. If nothing else, it just shows that you actually have done the research, um, which is something that it also took me a little while to figure out was um, like, I'd feel weird going into conversations with people and just being like, oh, you're doing this new project. And like, how was your honeymoon with your wife last weekend? You know, uh, based on things that I'd read on Twitter or on their most recent bio on their website. Um, and even more than trying to actually make a connection there, like a personal bond, you're like letting people know that you are diligent um, is one really great thing that comes out of that. If you've actually done your research on people and you start talking to people about it, uh, talking to the like the person you're negotiating with about that, then they know that you're that diligent with hopefully anything. Uh, and that alone is worth the time invested in it. Even if you don't find any similarities that you have to talk about, even if you don't find anything worthwhile, like your businesses have overlapped in some weird field and you can bring that up, at the very least, you've done your research and you can show that, and that ends up being really important too. Um, finding the decision maker uh, is one I won't talk about too much here, but that's an interesting one too, just something to kind of keep in the back of your heads. If you uh, find yourself stuck at some point is uh, sometimes you'll think that you're talking to the person who can make the decisions, and you just aren't uh, at all. And the kind of like introduction to that that I always hear in uh, sales books and things like that is um, the uh, trying to sell something to parents when the kid is the decision maker. Even though they have no money, they're not even like a legal uh, you know, citizen, they're not able to vote, they are still very much the decision maker in a lot of families when it comes to a lot of decisions. Uh, and so making sure to target the right person. Like if you find yourself at just a complete standstill and you're not going anywhere with this discussion, maybe you're not talking to the right person. Like maybe it's the person's secretary who is actually making these decisions and the one who's passing the papers on like, okay, you need to sign this today. And you'll never know unless you do a little more research. So that's just something that can pop up where that I found myself in before, where it's like, oh, okay, I was actually just barking up the complete wrong tree with this one. Um, Real quick, so any hints on finding the new decision maker besides basic words? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, that's a good one. Um, so finding a decision maker, um, I find that uh, asking if there's anyone else, like trying to get a meeting and asking if there's anyone else that should be involved in the meeting. Um, is a really good way to kind of cut down to the chase. Um, or should I be, same with like emails um, back and forth, like should I be um, carbon copying this along to someone else? Like are you the only one who needs this information? Is there anyone else involved? Um, that's kind of a good way to start getting a roundup of people, I think. Um, also, if you want to like towards the end of the line, um, finding out like, okay, so if we make this, um, oh, excuse me. Um, 
Yeah. If we make this uh, agreement, like if I do these things and if I do these and if we agree to this in this meeting, can we move forward? Like, are are you like, are we good? Like, are you actually authorized to just go forward with this right now? Um, is another good one towards the end of the process. I find that actually helps. Like, well, no, I need to run this by my executive team or management or whatever it is. Um, you know, and I would just like to add really quickly. Initially, finding the decision maker that kind of goes along with what he's talking about. He's talking about like when you actually know addresses of people to talk to and so forth. But to truly find out is maybe go on their website, get a list of people, CC them all into an int introductory email, and then create some, like an internal social pressure in the company, and then they'll talk to like their boss. Did you get that email from so-and-so? Yeah, oh, I passed it on to so And then you'll eventually get the appropriate person to respond back to you, and that's oftentimes the one you have to initially deal with. And I'll even like just, yeah, sort of start, yeah, for finding the person initially, just start individually targeting anyone. Usually I just start with the info at whatever, because 99% of the time that's the person who's running the business anyway. Um, and just like, yeah, send along an email and be like, this is probably going to the wrong person, but can you please forward it along to someone who can help? And like, keep, if you keep it really short, it's just such a like ludicrous request to not help you with. And if you don't hear anything back, you can email them in a couple days and be like, I know it was really small, but like, I just was wondering if you could get this to the right hands of someone who can actually get back to me and help me. And it's like, if you keep your requests really small and reasonable, it's like, it's really hard for people to say no to small things like that, I find too. Um, did that answer the, the question? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, you know, you get a website and you go, okay, who the hell should I talk to? You know what I mean? Oh, uh, yeah, I'd just start with the, like, 800 number or the info at. Like, start at just, like, the most basic level that you can with things is what I find is a good way in. Um, yeah, and then if that doesn't work, just you slowly start moving around. Usually that will actually be able to direct you to the right person as well. You get pretty good at cyber stalking people, you know. If you find <laughs> the, the owner's name, you might find the owner on LinkedIn, and you might get their email from there. You might have an article written about somebody else in the company, and you might find out who the CMO is and stuff like that. So yeah, Derek said Google, great. Google searching people. Derek's had great um, success using just like Twitter to basically like Twitter stalk people we want to get a hold of too. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would say like, you know, having your elevator pitch down really well to just hit those like fast topics that peak attention and they're like, oh, what's that? And then, then you're like, are you the person I should be talking to? And, you know, just flat out, I ask people that within the first minute and they're like, oh, no, you should be talking to this person. And then I get their box. I'm like, that's how you get through all the gatekeepers. A nice little spiel for like a minute, and then are you the person that I should be talking to? And then nope, here we go. Nice. Follow the line. <laughs> you know? nice. so. Um getting an in-person meeting obviously helps. Um it's just a really quick one. Um and I usually just work the fastest that I can to get an in-person meeting if that's at all possible, or like a Skype face-to-face -face sort of meeting, if not, um, I mean, yeah, that's just like basic, basic psychology is like when someone actually sees you and has all of these little social cues to interact with as well. It just, everything gets so much easier and there's so much more like trust and communication going on there. Um, talking to people when they're in a good mood totally helps. Um, it's why you have business lunches. It's why you have business dinners. Um, you putting, making someone's stomach full is a great way to put them in a really good mood, just even on a chemical level. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, it's in the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> Free martini lunch. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Actually, actually, we are looking for a beer sponsor. <laughs> <if anybody knows. laughs> yeah, getting people drunk. Great way to put them in a good mood. Yeah. Um, so now we get into actually the kind of cake. So that's a, that's a lot of background um, for you guys and a lot of the more um, generic sort of wisdom. But I want to give you like a little background for the actual cake tactics that we totally propose using. Um, and these ones have actually just been immensely useful for me, especially as I've worked to develop float on. Um, yeah, so it used to be a lot more um, shotgun style, I guess, for me, um, trying to get things done. Um, like figure if I, you know, I get turned down enough from just shooting out random requests to people that if I shoot off, you know, 20, that maybe one or two will actually get back to me and I can start pursuing those paths um, was how I approached a business before and we've started using this really focused um, just like onslaught on very selected uh, things that we want to get done that's just worked incredibly incredibly well so far um, and I kind of wanted to pass that along to you because I find that's what's really useful when you hit those moments where there actually is a roadblock like where this no that you need to get past is final and there aren't any, any ways to sneak around it and all you can do is kind of get to yes um, the health department was a good example of that for us. Um, like setting up uh, 
float tanks with, you know, salt water and having these baths. Um, you need to get them approved by the health department, but then they want you to run them like pools or spas, which um, involves running a pump constantly, which is impossible in sensory deprivation. Theoretically, if you followed all of the rules, we would have had to have, like, a sign that says no diving um, up and, like, an actual lifeguard on duty sitting outside of the tank, um, which is preposterous, right? Um, so there's... Uh, there's things that come up where it's just like you actually cannot open your doors unless we get this go ahead. And that's what um, I find that really just like focused blasting helps. Um, and I'll break that down for you. So um, some conventional, wis conventional wisdom, no is the beginning of the conversation. You'll hear that a lot in sales books as well. Um, you'll want to hear no seven times before you give up. That's that familiarity thing again. Um, you want to make sure that they're like familiar with your product or whatever it is you're doing enough that you hear no seven times. And then maybe they mean it by the seventh. Um, whatever you're doing, um, like whatever it is that you're trying to get done, um, actually means a lot to you. And people also know that if they turn someone down, chances are that person is not going to come back and keep harassing them forever. Um, there's so many cold, uh, sales calls that we get just walking in our door who are like, oh, we really want you to try out this thing. And I'm like, okay, great. Like come back in a week and tell me about it. And they just never come back. Like that's my first little like barrier to entry for anyone who wants to give me a sales call. It's like, oh yeah, definitely just come back here in a week. And even that, like just showing up at the same place a week later is impossible for most people. So a lot of that initial barrier to entry is what you can blast past with this. Um, so if, you, it's, if it actually means a lot to you and if you have something that you actually need to get past, just really um, knowing that you're going to get past it and focusing that energy. So what I say is like people value their time a lot. So what you really need to do is make it more valuable for them, like more time uh, beneficial for them to say yes than it is to say no. Um, and starting, you have a lot of barriers. Like I said, you have all of this. As soon as they say yes, then they actually have to start doing something. They have to change something in their lives or they have to give something out. Um, and you need to make sure that that no side of things uh, makes it maybe even take up a little more of their time uh, to, to keep turning you down than it does to get a yes from you. Um, so a good example of that was getting our space for the float shop um, was kind of where we really started using this. And I'll give another example of even earlier when we were getting permits. Um, but we found this space on Hawthorne um, for float on. We just like, we knew that we wanted it. It was perfect. We checked out a few others. And so I called up the landlord and uh, he was just like, ah, float tanks, what are these? I have no idea. This sounds like a terrible match for the building. Like, no, we're not going to rent to you. Um, and so I called him up again the next day and was like, hey, these float tanks, like, I went and dropped off this book for you, it should be mailed off to you, I left a bunch of paperwork on what float tanks are, like, if you could just look them over, I actually think it's a really good fit. And he's like, okay, well, I'll check it out, but I think it's bad. And I called him three days later and he hadn't looked at any of it. Um, and uh, so I talked to him again, I'm like, okay, like, can we just meet in person? Like, I really think that we do really well, we have a business plan all laid out, like, we're ready to go. And he's like, okay, okay, you can have like 10 minutes of my time. And I show up with a half an hour presentation prepared um, in the morning and just start like delivering it to him. And we get like five minutes through and he's like, how long is this going to take? And I was like, don't worry, it's only like 25 more minutes. <laughs> and like, that's exactly when I, and then he's just like, okay, look, I got to go. Like, okay, like we'll meet up later. We can sign the papers. Like you can have the place. It's all right. And I was like completely high glass. It was just like, no, 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 no. Until eventually he was just like, okay, like this is well, like, I'm going to have to sit through how many of these presentations? Like they're going to tell me how many times a week to like badger me about this. Um, and it actually works incredibly well. Like sometimes you really do have to make it easier for people down to like everything from like, if that hadn't worked, I would have like actually just started, started like trying to figure out what lease agreement he used and like printed it out and get it totally filled out so that all he needs is his signature. Like doing other people's work for them down to the like exact point when you actually need whatever it is you need from them <laughs> is another great way. Cause that takes away that uh, difficulty in saying no, like that time commitment that comes with saying yes. You want to eliminate as much of that as you possibly can. Um, yeah, over-prepare and overdo things. Um, leaving people with uh, over-documentation for stuff. Are we back online? We're good, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, leaving people with over-documentation of uh, what you're doing is also really great. Um, yeah, like, uh, and along with there's a little caveat that goes with that. So I'll give the overall view first, which is, um, once again, people don't have time. And the more that, so if you get someone to agree to, okay, if you send along these materials, I'll read through them. And then two days later, they haven't read through them. That's suddenly a little bargaining chip that you have in your corner. Um, they've now not fulfilled an obligation that they said that they were going to do. Yeah. Um, so the more that you can provide those, the more that you can do really reasonable things and stay really on top of those and provide people with more information, with more documentation, with more whatever it is, even just like personal appeals, like letters from customers that you have saying like, please let them open this location or whatever it is you're trying to get accomplished. Um, 
just the time necessary to absorb all of that information, they kind of push it aside. And then if you stay on top of it, you get to negotiate that side of things. Um, oh yeah, that, so that was where, yeah, so the permit department, um, for instance, is a really good example of just kind of overdoing it. So we got all of our permits approved for float on in one week um, because we had to, uh, because we just wanted to open up. And so we just, every single day um, that they were open that week, from open until close, either me or uh, my co-owner Quinn was in the permit office there, just like talking to them and going through the process, like for the entire week. Um, <laughs> and so they just like knew who we were, and then, like a bunch of them came to float after that because they just knew who the float guys were. They're like, why are you guys in here every week? We're like, because we really need to open this shop. And uh, like they tell us something, and we just like go home and redraft it on the plans and go back like that same afternoon and start the entire process over again. And so much of it is just waiting like in the permit office, like it's not actually just talking to people and going through things, it's like sitting with a number and all of your plans for like an hour at a time and then like slowly going through people. So the fact that we were doing this just day after day, like we started being just rushed through the lines <laughs> at, at the permit office and people just started calling us by name, which was really crazy. Like they got to know us and just like the fact that we were so hell bent on getting this thing passed <laughs> that we were like, they're the same working hours that they were, was like enough to really actually push it through. Um, so just an example of how that can work too. So crazy. What kind of standards did they end up giving you the health department to meet um, The end result of the, so that was just the permit office. That wasn't even health department. That was just building permits and stuff like that. Um, the end result of the health department discussions, which um, you can ask me later, like how we ended up going through that one. That's an even crazier story, which I'll talk about, like, yeah, it's over beers sometime. Um, the end result of that was that we're unregulated in Oregon now. Um, so float tanks just don't have, um, yeah, uh, regulations going with them. Interesting. Okay, I'll be interested in how you got into that class. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> so uh, another, another thing that goes along with this is, um, is consistency. And you'll start to notice that even in these talks about uh, the early interactions, like having this consistency of making sure to call them every couple days, making sure that you're actually getting them information really immediately that you say you're going to send them. Um, it's really important because they have nothing to go on except what you say at the beginning. Like they just meet you, maybe they have a piece of paper, maybe they have your initial com communications, um, maybe you've built a business and they have that to go on a little bit. But other than that, they don't actually know that you're dependable. Like they don't know that you're going to provide the things that you say that you're going to provide. And so even within your microcosm of an interaction with them, you need to show them that. Like anytime you say you're going to send them something, you need to send it just immediately. Anytime they ask for something, you need to give them something more than what they asked for and like also just immediately after your conversation. The more that you're just totally on the ball, the more that you show what you're going to do when you actually enter into this agreement with them. Um, and that ends up being critical. Um, also just the act of giving auxiliary information um, gives you an excuse to follow up in a couple days. Like I try to never leave a conversation without something that I can do um, after it. Um, even if it's just wait. You know what I mean? Like sometimes, sometimes that's it. So I'm like, really? Like, so the end result of this is that I just have to wait for four days while you talk to other people and then I can check in again? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, great. And in four days, I go and I check in again, like immediately in four days and be like, so what was the result of that conversation? Yeah, you have to stay on top of these things. Um, but yeah, never leave without something that you know what your next step is going to be, even if it's just contacting them at a later date. That's how you end up dropping the ball and then you drop consistency and then the entire thing just starts dissolving. Um, be consistent in continual contact too. Um, a lot of people get really excited about their ideas and really excited about the, what they want in the moment. And then that fades away. That's that whole, yeah, sure, come back and talk to me in a week. And then no one shows up. Uh, so being able to show that you are that person who shows up in a week, even without being asked, uh, is kind of the goal there. Like being consistent in your future contacts with people. Um, Here's a, here, and this, uh, we went over this one too in another uh, cake, uh, but I'll go over it again really briefly, which is kind of my, another recipe for getting things done in the long term, um, which is yet to fail actually, uh, which is if you can't get anyone, like someone to agree to what you need them to, um, you just kind of lay out a plan for them of here's, where I, here's what I say I'm going to do and where I'm going to be in one year and why I think this is going to mold really well with what it is that I need from you, whether it's money, whether it's just like, a place, whether it's, yeah, some kind of actual just like governmental approval, whatever it is. Um, and then every three months, you email them an update on it and say like, hey, here's where I said I was going to be. Here's where I am. Just wanted to keep you posted. Like, I still think that I'm going to be here in a year or here's my updated plans. And you just do that. And after a year, like of these kind of quarterly updates, it's amazing. Like people just actually have trust in you at that point. Like if you, you're able to plan out 
in a, a year in advance and not only meet but hopefully exceed like another goal is to kind of project a little smaller than you think and hopefully even like go past those markers that you said people are so much more likely to go along with you especially if they're not the kind of people who are your friends to begin with these are like strangers you're meeting and trying to get something out of this consistency across the board, like across however many months it is, or a year, even like a three month plan, you can kind of condense it down to a mini version of that. Amazing, like absolutely wonderful at getting things done. Um, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. How do you remind yourself every three to four months, hey, get, get in touch with these folks? Do you have a- Phone alarms. Tickler, 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 tickler. Digital brain. Something I'll remind Is that what they call it? Tickler system. Tickler system, that's what I was always taught. Mm -hmm. I, I need a marker. <laughs> yeah, those ones are like crucial. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You have to have something like that. And it also lets people know that you have those systems in place too, which is great. It's kind of that same thing as, yeah, the more responsibility and just general commitment that you can show to it, the more that people know that that's what you apply to all of your projects as well. Like if you have to follow up with a customer every three months for a year, they know that you're going to be doing that too. Like it just says so much about your overall business ethos, I guess. Um, I usually try to make a list of 10 people, like when I want something like that, where I'm really going for a long-term plan. Um, as long as I'm going to be writing up an update, there's no reason to, or write up an update, there's no reason to waste that on just a single person. So even if you're just asking from someone, you might as well add nine other people to the list and send it along to them as well, uh, if it makes sense to. Um, reciprocity is uh, the other part of uh, my like general tactic for getting things done. So that uh, determination and consistency go, I'd say, 90% of the way. Then there's little tactics. There's all the things that um, Cialdini talks about in influence, being likable, things like that. Uh, I find reciprocity is a really important one. And he talks about it first in there, too, I think, even in the book. Um, and that one is, uh, I mean, the, the basic way of saying it is like when you give some, someone something, they're much more likely to want to give something back to you. Uh, and it's amazing how much we don't even consider that. A little like side note tangent, just kind of uh, beef with a lot of advertising is like, you read a paper ad in a newspaper and it's just like telling you all about some business that you can go to and giving you nothing back. Um, a coupon is a little bit better if you're like, oh, cut this out and get 20% off of this business that you go into. Like, that's wonderful. Um, even better than that is, uh, I mean, I, and I personally just think that this is a great um, tactic for print ads in general, unless you're like a huge company, is the advertorial. Uh, which is you write uh, an ad, like you take the ad space to basically write a column um, out about something. Um, same thing, I've also just had amazing, like way better success with that than any, like I've actually had ne like negative financial success with any other type of print ad that I've tried to put out. Um, and the reason that I've heard it explained um, really clearly to me that made sense is just people are going there, like are going into a paper to read something. Um, and they like that's what they're there for. So even if it's just an ad, but if it's well written, and it's about your product and it's something interesting. Like if you're just talking about like stupid things about your product, like no one's gonna want to read that. Like there's really crappy advertorials. If you're giving actual interesting information, then vice versa, they just won't care that it's an ad. It's story. Like yeah, you're providing them information, and that's great. That's what they were there for. Um, and that to me is kind of the basis of this reciprocity thing. Like you, even taking out an ad, you're trying to give something back to whoever's looking at the ad. Um, so when you're presenting something to someone, make sure not in the sense of like oh, here's a Coke, or like, hey, I brought you an extra coffee when I went to the, you know, down to the coffee shop um, before I came here, which is great, like, you can do that, um, but make sure that your presentation is actually doing something for them as well, like, even if they walk out of the presentation saying no, hopefully you've left them with something, like, whether it's information, whether it's, you know, connections to someone else who you think just might be good for their business, going and being like, hey, I'm working with these other businesses to try and get my product on the line, I think you'd really do good contacting them, here's their information, I already told them that you might call, if nothing else, I've left you with that, and then you go on to your pitch. Like, leaving them with something that's actually useful is just really crucial. Um, and another side of that that I find even more interesting is uh, uh, giving and kind of reciprocity, but from the other person's standpoint. So it turns out, uh, and there's a classic Benjamin Franklin example about this one, too, that I see all over the place, uh, but it's really good. It's um, if someone, like, if you give something to someone, uh, Human beings are great at backwards, ra backwards rationalization. So this goes back into kind of the psychology part of it again. Um, so we think that we have feelings and that we feel like that we uh, sense things, that we do actions based on these feelings. Uh, much more often, actually, what we do is we act uh, kind of based on instincts. And then we go backwards and we rationalize them and say, oh, I acted this way because of this. Um, which is really crazy. Like, human beings are just masters at this, so, like explaining away our own actions. Um, and uh, it turns out that we do that same thing with when we're generous to people or when we're giving or when we're cruel or anything like that. Like, uh, so 
on the cruel side, if we like hit someone, we're like, oh, I must have hit that person for a reason. I don't like them. I don't like that person. That's why I hit them. Um, if we do something nice for someone, we send them a gift, let's say. Uh, we say, oh, I must really like that person. Like I took time out of my day to send them a gift. Um, so finding something small that someone else can do for you when you want something bigger from them is a really good first step, too. Um, getting them to kind of just do you a really small favor to begin with kind of paves the way for, oh, I must have done that small favor for a reason. I guess I want to help this person out. And you can kind of snowball that into bigger ones. Benjamin Franklin used the example of uh, this guy who he was, um, I forget the name now, which is going to make this um, no less interesting a story because I'm pretty sure very few people would know who the name was. Um, and uh, it was just like <laughs> this person who hated Benjamin Franklin, um, like one of his uh, kind of academic rivals at the time. And um, he was trying to figure out how to get this guy to finally come around and actually engage with him. And uh, what he did was he knew that the person was a bibliophile and had one of the largest libraries uh, in the United States at that time. And Benjamin Franklin was just known for collecting his large volumes of tomes and owning his printing presses. And uh, so he sent a letter to the guy saying, hey, I heard you have a copy of this, insert rare eccentric book here. I was wondering if you could send it along to me for a little while. I, I just was really curious about it. And so the guy's like, oh, yeah, of course, and had, you know, posted it, had one of his servants, like, write it down there. And uh, Benjamin Franklin, a week later, sends it back with a handwritten note saying how much he enjoyed it and um, asked for another book from the library, and the guy sent him another one, and, er, like, and then he runs into him in person a month later. And they're on great terms. Suddenly they're best buddies, and this guy <laughs> had just been denouncing Benjamin Franklin and saying nothing but, like, the most awful things about him to everyone was suddenly on his side. And it was this kind of weird backwards rationalization of, I did something nice for someone. I must actually want to associate with them. Um, it seems so backwards to ask something of someone <laughs> so they like you. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's an interesting way to think about it. But yeah, um, also works really well. So figuring out those small things that you can ask from people. Um, small things can be um, a recommendation. A referral, even like a five-minute phone conversation is a really good way to start with the small thing that you can ask from someone. Um, asking for a review of your product, asking someone to just like look at or use something when you're sending them a free sample is another um, example of something small. Um, if you offer a service, just being like, hey, can I massage you for 60 minutes is like also even something like, if you phrase it like that, like uh, something else that you can um, toss in there too, if you're a massage therapist, not just like you should massage <laughs> someone for like 60 minutes just for the hell of it and like throw that into the mix, yeah. Um, <laughs> it still might be effective. Not saying you shouldn't massage someone for 60 minutes if that's not your product. Um, okay, so uh, just to reiterate again, because I find those, that's kind of like my own personal cake recommendation is that um, being consistent um, and being determined. And then um, reciprocity, I find, is kind of the most acute tactic that I find works really well for kind of sneaking in there and getting to the other two. Um, there's a lot of other things that I could talk about, too. Um, the BATNA was one that I, I mentioned before, the best alternative to negotiated agreement. That's from um, a bunch of Harvard studies. Getting to Yes was a book that was written by a bunch of um, uh, Harvard researchers on negotiating, uh, which is actually really good. It's all just like, like once again, be a reasonable human being is the, <laughs> the baseline of that book. Um, but the other thing they introduced there is called the BATNA, uh, which is their big thesis, I guess, of the, of the book, which is your best alternative to negotiated agreement. And the idea with that is that when you go into any negotiation or any conversation even, you should know what you're going to do if you get no as a response. And that basically just strengthens your position so much because you actually know what your bottom line is in that case. Like, if we had gotten no from the Hawthorne person, there was just no moving past that. It's like, okay, we go out and look for another location, you know, and try to find another one that we're really into. I didn't like that, so I was willing to push him really hard to get that place. Uh, but if he had said, you know, okay, well, yeah, sure. We'll give it to you. We have someone else interested. But if you want to pay double the rent for this place as opposed to the person who's already interested, then we'll give it to you. It's like, no, like, I have my bat now. Like, I can just go find another place. Like, I know exactly what I'm doing here. Um, so having that in mind, actually, really, and if you don't have it, you'll find that you just feel lost is what I found. Like, before I even knew what that was called, um, I'd end up in conversations where I'm like, I don't know, like, I, I don't know if this is the right decision or if what I'm making is good for my business or me. Um, and knowing what your bottom line is, yeah, that alternative, any alternative, is really important. Um, yeah, uh, one thing that that same author also describes is that your, one of your best options is if you can find out who you're negotiating with, what their Batman is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one of the opportunities to get to their yes, is because you, if you're stepping across to their side and you're trying to, you know, you're both trying to, like you're saying, be mutually agreeable, favorable situation. Is see if you can figure out their definitely, yeah, that's yeah. That's powerful. That's a really good point. Yeah, right. And if the other person hopefully has, yeah, even if they don't have it concrete in mind, there is something that they will have to do. If yeah, you do not. Yeah, having 
Oh uh, yeah, approaching their bedna is also super. Yeah, thank you, time. That's perfect. Um, once again, um, when you hit resistance, another thing, um, so having the batna is really good for resistance, and what that can tell you is just when you should back off, too. Like, sometimes when you hit resistance, you actually don't want to push. Sometimes you're like, I just need to cut my losses and save my own time here, and just get out of here altogether. Um, and that's something I want to talk about, too. Like, hopefully the end result of this, um, and my, my uh, kind of focus on, focus, I guess, uh, is that the shotgun effect ends up wasting a lot of time. Like, you'd still end up with those one or two people who went along with something, but they weren't that engaged with it, and you wasted so much time. Uh, like, what I found was it wasn't that I'd send out a message to 20 people, and I'd get two responses, and that was it. I'd get, like, 10 responses, and then eight of them would slowly fall away, and I'd have to waste time on all eight of those that were slowly trickling away in the background in the meantime. Um, and starting to focus on things, it's like you just get to cut all of the nonsense, like, all of the effort that you're putting into it, even though it is a great a deal of effort per person, you actually get a return on that, hopefully, and if you don't, then, I don't know, I guess you get better and better at what you're doing slowly as you learn from it. Um, another thing when you hit resistance, uh, making sure you actually know what their concerns are ends up being really important, um, and that you're addressing their concerns too. And this is just like sales 101 kind of stuff, um, but it's a, once again, it's amazing once you're in that conversation, how much that like for some reason your instincts like do not kick in to tell you to do that all the time. Um, like asking questions and actually getting down to what people want. Um, and getting in there to make sure that you're solving the, and lots of times too, I found when you solve those concerns of what they say their concerns are, those were never their concerns. Those were the easiest things to say. Like, it's almost like you have to work to get to their concerns because saying no and giving a lame concern is actually easier than saying no and giving a legitimate one. Um, so you have to like brush past those first ones and be like, oh, okay, well, what if I just did all the work for you and like came in and worked like, you know, 20 extra hours on this thing and like paid my alert, and drop all the contracts and like all you had to do was sign a paper and they're like, uh, well, I still don't think it's a good idea because, and then you get down to like what the real business is. Um, and uh, so along with addressing their concerns, a lot of times what addressing their concerns does is actually get down to their real concerns, which you can then, then address. Um, ties in again, asking a lot of questions. It has a lot to do with that. Uh, sometimes yes, also, just isn't the goal. Uh, sometimes people can't give you what you want, and sometimes you can't give people what they need. And sometimes it's obvious that it's going to take way more time or money than it's worth your while. Uh, and sometimes uh, you just don't need something that immediately. And it's more worth your time to build up your own reputation and show them like that's when you take that kind of long, one year long plan approach to things. Sometimes it's more efficient to wait and come back for it a little later. Uh, so just something to think about. And that's along with that BATNA, knowing when to actually drop certain things. Um, hopefully what this does is not actually just get you through those life or death, I need this answer situations, but also through um, not wasting time on all of the discussions that lead up to those no's. Like the more conversations you have that just lead up to a sh shut off opportunity, that's all just pretty much wasted time. Unless you like, you can always chalk it up to skill development, I guess. And like, at least you got to know this many times, so maybe next time you'll get to yes sort of thing. Um, but you just want to cut off as many of those as possible still. And um, yeah, those are really good signs. Uh, and asking people just like upfront, like point blank, is a really good way to find that out too. Can you actually give me this? Like if I do this for you, will that be useful? Or what do you want from me that would make you go along with what I'm saying? Uh, you know, if I, yeah, if I am able to show that I have like a reasonable business plan and enough money to pay rent for five months out, can we talk about me renting the space? If, you know, yeah, things like that. Uh, I don't need to go to, uh, that all makes sense to people. I don't think I need to delve too much into that. Um, Follow-up is the last real like cake advice on this one, which is just an easy one to mess up on. Because um, once you have what you want from someone, like once you actually have this location from the landlord, it's really easy to not send a thank you note um, even afterwards saying like, hey, like thanks so much for believing in us and like, hey, here's two free floats if you want to come in, which is exactly what I did after we got the space from our landlord, even though it was just a rental agreement, you know, there's nothing special about that. Um, but it's still like, hey, send them a couple free float certificates. Thank you so much for like taking the time to talk about us and taking on such like a weird business. And uh, that has also just done a lot for our further relations now when there's like a hole to patch in the roof for when our neighbors are making too much. By the way, having a sensory deprivation place is hell on your neighbors because they can never do construction without annoying you. Um, so like whenever our neighbors are making too much construction noise and I call the landlord and complain, he's always super reasonable instead of saying that we're making like just crazy demands out of like people not being able to make any noise in the spaces next to us. Um, 
Yeah, and um, right. And but I honestly think like a lot of it was just that approach too, and being really thorough, and a lot of the follow up too, and just making sure that he knew like every step of the way that we and like with those two, you know, if they quiet down within the next half an hour and suddenly they're not making noise, you send the landlord a really nice note saying like, hey, like thank you so much for taking care of that. Like, and it's the same getting the yes sort of thing, but the follow up ends up being crucial. Um, and you get a reputation around too, you know, the business world and just the world in general is really small. And uh, even if you're not actively directing people to references, they will find them and people will find out how you do business. And the more that you actually have this follow-up plan and the more that you go along with it, the better that people will like you. And I suggest making, by the way, the, the cake suggestion in this is make a follow-up plan before you even start in on the negotiation. Um, because otherwise you will get it and you'll be so exhausted from the entire process most likely that you will not go through with the follow-up plan. Like it is so easy to not actually have that down. Um, the last thing you want to be worried about at the very end is like racking your brain for like, okay, and you're so tied up in like the specifics of it too. You're like, you've lost all object objectivity at that point. Um, having a plan of like, here's how I'm going to show appreciation if they go along with this before you go into it. And then you finish it and all you have to do is follow your plan. Um, it just takes all the pressure off. You just do this one little last task and then you're done with the entire thing. And like that, is wonderful. I, every time I don't have an actual plan going in, I just never do it. Like, I never do the follow-up. Yeah. It's really bad. Um, so, but I've started making a plan every time. That's the, yeah. Can you do ticklers? <laughs> exactly. When you make the plan, do a little, yeah, yeah. do a tickler for yeah. sure. Um, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nasty clamp. Always raising the bar here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so in conclusion, you always want to massage people who agree with you. Um, okay, and then practice for this. Uh, I actually have a really simple piece. I wrote down like probably five different things you can do to practice, and I actually just cut all this out because one just kind of covers it all. Um, which is uh, one that actually uh, mine and Ashton's friends started doing, which is just try to get rejected from something every day. Like try to get someone to just turn you down and like say no to you every day for something. Um, and it's amazing the kinds of things. What did he do? Like with his credit? Was it credit cards? It was called his, uh, his car insurance. A friend of ours was doing this for thirty days, and he was just trying. Like he would just ask people with holding a dozen donuts walking down the street, like, "Can I have a donut?" And they'd be like, "Yeah, here you go." And it would be kind of like way harder than um, than he thought it would be to get people to say no. Um, to the point where he just called his car insurance company one day and was like, "Can you just give me a lower rate?" And the woman was like, I'm here, let me see what I can do. And <laughs> 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 yeah, just pays less car insurance every month. Like, yeah, it's really amazing. Just straight blunt questions like that. I got to be blessed or something. I bet if you walk into strangers and said, can I give you a massage? <laughs> right, so do that once a day and you're good. <laughs> um, but it's probably like shockingly harder to actually like get people to say no to things sometimes than you'd think. Um, it also just gives you the confidence going forward and getting that no too if you're like willing to slowly move forward from there. I, I just find that's a great way, yeah, whether it's negotiating your car insurance or just like getting a donut off someone on the street or yeah, trying to get like ads for cheaper in the paper, whatever it is that you want to do that you're already paying out money for, just like try and negotiate a little better and use some of these tactics and see what happens. And you slowly just, it's like, you know, it's like support muscles when you're lifting free weights. They just slowly start building up and you, you find your own little tactics in here. And um, like I said, there's a million books on this and on sales where you can start filling in your own things too. I've read so many sales tactics that just flat out don't work for me. And sometimes I read books and get like two things that just work incredibly well and I've ditched almost everything else that I do in sales. Um, it's really weird the things that just seem to resonate with your own personal disposition. And I'm sure like that book that I read was the cold experience of like 40 years of some person's sales experience saying this is the things that worked for me that I developed over 40 years and it's like maybe two of those work for me. So the more we just kind of go through and figure out different people's tactics, um, I think the more successful we end up being. And to bring it back to the very beginning uh, here at the end, which is a good place to do that, uh, is to say that this all, like, ev all the tactics that you find and all of the individual things really tie into those uh, chemical systems that we have going on in our brains and our bodies. Like at some point, we're getting some signal that says, yes, this is the correct decision, go forward with it. And at some point, that's the signal that we're looking for in other people. And um, thinking about the fact that these systems that we're trying to activate are the feel-good systems. You know, it's dopamine, it's serotonin. It's the systems that get us excited and give us that like whoosh, like we're going down a roller coaster. You know, it's the epinephrine and norepinephrine systems that are the decision makers. So the more you can activate those, the more you can make it fun for someone, the more you can make interacting with you, just being a human being and make them feel good about that, um, the better they'll feel. And if like all they get is a reward from their bank account and from seeing the dollars go up, then like activate that dopamine release system. You know what I mean? Like fine, give them the money going up so that they get that release. Um, but know that that's really what you're trying to get is those feel, you're trying to make them feel good. 
about things in the very end. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say about that. <laughs> uh, thank you guys very much. Um, and uh, we'll be back in a second for, uh, for the workshop portion of this, which is actually like very workshoppy this time. Sometimes we do more discussion and stuff. Um, yeah, this one I'm going to just take one or two examples and actually workshop through the preparation and like the plan for trying to get something, like trying to get that yes answer, and then the follow-up as well. Uh, so yeah, we'll take uh, five or ten minutes. Uh, feel free to mill around. Once again, we are donation-based, so feel free to toss in some money. We also have um, a square, so you can always slide it and donate that way, um, or donate online through PayPal. Yep, and uh, thank you so much. We'll see you in ten minutes.